Hey guys, what's up? Today we have part two in our multi-part series telling a history of Mercedes. Today we see Mercedes establishing itself as the car company that we know today. Before we, got we had Daimler and we had Maybach and we had DMG. We had all these other things, mm -hmm. but today we finally see for the first time a car by the name Mercedes, made by the Mercedes Motor Company. We learn how it's really easy to sell a car to a rich guy if you just beat his car uh, two weeks in a row. Yeah. yeah, and then we have some real weirdo yeah. who changed his last name and took credit for building. Yeah, a little uh, slippery Mercedes. guy named yeah. Jelly Neck that slippery. slides in and he screws things up. And so then, like uh, everything else of this era, we start talking about World War II and Nazis. So that's today on Pass Gas. It's literally impossible to not talk about. <laughs> June 1926, an era of progress, rapid automotive adoption, and record-breaking feats spurred on by the rivalry between Benz and DMG had given way to crisis. The companies themselves were hardly recognizable from where they were a decade prior. The leadership had changed dramatically. Benz had sold off its stationary engine manufacturing sector, and DMG had resorted to building bicycles, typewriters, and furniture just to stay afloat. Ugh, how embarrassing. <laughs> With their backs against the wall, executives from the once fierce rival companies decided to merge resources and become a single entity, Daimler Benz AG. But mistrust lingers in the air. While Benz brings an impressive fleet of commercial vehicles and diesel engines to the table, they are largely seen as the company benefiting the most from this deal, thanks to DMG's prestigious Mercedes brand. But let's back up a bit. How did a conniving aristocrat convince DMG to create the Mercedes brand? How did DMG and Benz usher in the era of the modern automobile? And how did these two competitors find themselves in a position where the only way to ensure their survival was to merge? Today on Pass Gas, it's part two of the history of Mercedes-Benz. Pass Gas Podcast, it's about cars, it's not about sports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Shopify. That's right, sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash gas. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. So I hire writers for Donut all the time. I think Indeed is one of the best tools that you can use, especially with their Instant Match feature. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash passgas. Offer good for a limited time. Need to hire? You need Indeed. That was like the beginning of a Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. Like it's just oh, like yes. catches you up yeah. on it. Very One good. time in Germany, can we get a, a of Star years Wars ago. sound alike over the top of that? There wasn't. They didn't read the narration out loud. No. Sort of. I have to change it a little bit. It sounds like Skrillex did a little remix of it. People pop up. I was going to ask a really boring question, but let's not. Let's move into it. Hello, my name is Nolan Sykes. Welcome back to Past Gas. I'm joined, as always, by my co hosts, Screwdriver James Pumphrey. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. <laughs> what was that what noise that your that mouth DJ made? DJ Shadow doing something. I don't know. Something's up with all of us. <laughs> I'm in a weird mood this week. Joe, how are you doing? That's Joe Weber over I'm there. I'm doing great. What's nice. up? Nice. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing well. The Santa Ana winds have made it very dry in LA. Oh my God. I haven't stopped sneezing for two weeks. Yeah. We're going to talk about how Mer Mercedes and DMG went all in on this merger with Benz. How nice, about that? Nice, dude. Yeah. Nice. Let's do it. Emil Jelinek was a wealthy Austrian aristocrat born in 1853 in Leipzig, Germany. By the late 1800s, he had made a home on the French Riviera. Nice. 
and like many aristocrats yeah. of the time, nice. had acquired a taste for automobiles. I feel like nice. I woke up with Jelly Neck this morning. <laughs> Jelly Neck? <laughs> Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Jesselneck? <laughs> Jelly Neck had visited the DMG Konstock factory in 1897, where he purchased a six horsepower, belt driven, two cylinder motor carriage. Ooh. And even though the vehicle had turned heads in Nice, Jelly Neck was unsatisfied with the 15 mile per hour top speed. So he reached back out to the DMG factory with a special request for two new vehicles with top speeds of 25 miles per hour. Noise. In September of 1898, Jelly Neck received two of DMG's eight horsepower front engine Phoenix vehicles, the world's first road going vehicle with a four cylinder engine. It did not have VTEC. Despite his enjoyment <laughs> of the new fast cars, it's believed that Jelly Neck had placed the order with a plan to turn a profit and that he already had his first customer in mind, one Baron Arthur de Rothschild. Rothschild was a wealthy auto enthusiast known for spending his mornings racing his panhard motor carriage up to the top of the nearby. Latterby Hill near Nice. I've been there. Latterby. Legend has it that one morning, to Rothschild's surprise, Jelly Neck had appeared behind him while he was driving up Latterby and passed the 10 mile per hour panhard in his 15 mile per hour DMG motor carriage. Nice. Uh, surprise. <laughs> toot toot. On your right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the top of the hill, Rothschild. Climbed I out. love that, like, this is, uh, this is like a badass move. Mm -hmm. Like, this is like. Yeah. Oh, like he knows the dude's route. Yeah. He knows that he zooms around all the yeah. time. He knows that he's going to be there that yeah. morning. And I'm going to sneak up on I'm the Baron. Sneak up on the Baron and I'm going to pass him. But then they're going 15 miles an hour. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so funny. Just like, yeah. Which is like not as fast as a child can go on a bike. There's like a cloud that's like burning them. <laughs> yeah. It's like a little, a little kid passes him going downhill on, on a, a bike. tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> Like I think, and they have like the the goggles and like the scarf, and it's just not even blowing in the wind. I think there's humans who can run 15. Dude. Yeah, Tyreek Hill can run 22.7 yeah, miles per hour. Like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At Cody Co <laughs> passes them yeah. on mile 18, yeah. training for a marathon. At the top of the hill, Rothschild climbed out of his panhard to inspect Jelly Neck's DMG. Hey, and you're, you were going almost as fast as that baby back there. <laughs> and after a short conversation, you, were, you almost you almost passed that runaway shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> and after a short conversation, Rothschild was the DMG's proud new owner. A few weeks later, Jelly Neck caught Rothschild by surprise again when he passed Rothschild's newly acquired 15 mile per hour DMG in his 25 mile per hour Phoenix. Again, after a brief conversation at the top of the hill, Jelinek sold yet another vehicle to Rothschild. Dude, this guy's such a mark. That's so Yeah, what funny. a mark, dude. He's like the chocolate salesman from SpongeBob. Ah. Uh, Patrick. <laughs> nice, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> Jelly Dude, Neck's, that got me right in the field. <laughs> Jelly Neck's business continued for quite a while. By early, <laughs> how long? <laughs> Every other day, he's just passing this dude. Yeah. Uh, you promise you ain't got another one? <laughs> I'll buy this one if you don't have a faster one next yeah, week. I promise. <laughs> well, by early 1899, DMG had sold Jelly Neck. As many 715. As ten, 10 vehicles, <laughs> uh, the majority of which he sold to other wealthy residents on the French Riviera. So he was pulling this thing on rich guys all over yeah. the place. It was a good situation for Jelinek, but no one yet knew the legacy-defining influence he was about to have on the company. Hey, I think we should just hunt people down and <laughs> <laughs> sell them faster That's cars. That's still how Mercedes sells cars today. I got passed by Mercedes on my way to work and they were like, what'd you like to buy? Yeah. I was like, I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta have this car. I would you like to sit car. in the luxury of a C-Class? <laughs> I had a lot of fun on my way to work today. You did? Yeah. I had two cars because I was in I was in the mood. Mm -hmm. I was I was well, here racing, for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Felt the sunshine on your face. Yeah. So I, I like when you drive a modified car, people want to mm -hmm. tell you that their car is faster mm -hmm. and so on my way here there was a young business type in a mustang hmm. oh and he wanted it mm -hmm. and i was like not today pal 
and I zoom zooms all around him, ran circles. And then finally we got on the 405 and he, I was like getting off on my exit and he was like, Wah! like so mad. He was probably going to go make some sales calls. Probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, and then when I got off the freeway, there was a Land Rover that wanted it. And guess what? I gave it a to A Land him. Rover wanted to race for pigs? Land Rovers are fast. Yeah. They got the HSV model, yeah. which is pretty But it's quick. still 5,000 pounds. Yeah, but it's a new car. My car's 40 years old. Yeah. My car's working its little booty off. That's true. Ah! Ah! <laughs> well, he got a heart transplant. He did. Yeah. Is the engine the heart? I no, know it's people the say. stomach, I think. I feel like it's the legs. No, the wheels. The, the wheels axles, are the legs. Axles yeah, are axles the legs. Axles are the legs. Wheels yeah. are the shoes. No, wheels are the feet. Gas is the shoes. Gas is the food or gas the blood. Gas is the food. Oil's the blood. Oil's the blood. Gas yeah. is the food. Dude. Oils the blood, gas is the food. 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 I think we found the plot for the next like Mad Max. Yeah, join yeah. our church. Oils the blood, gas is the food. <laughs> Carol Shelby is Jesus. <laughs> Carol Shelby, you scared the crap out of me. <laughs> you want to buy this car? You want to buy this car? At the turn of the century, DMG was in a state of flux. Gottlieb Daimler was suffering from a worsening heart condition and had stepped away from his managerial duties, leaving the company's daily operations in the hands of Wilhelm Maybach. Mm. Dude, I have a heart condition, but suffering from a worsening heart condition sounds terrifying. Yeah. Like mine, I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just like doing my thing. Yeah. I go for runs. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, do my job, talk to my gal. Yeah. Chill with my homies, mm -hmm. you know, go on vacation. Mm -hmm. I'm not even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But to retire from your job from a worsening heart condition, you're like, you wake up and you're like, fuck, like my chest really hurts today. Yeah. I got to stop selling cars. Plus, this is back in the 1800s, so people don't even know what the hell's going on in there. They think there's a mouse on a wheel. <laughs> well, they think that need. Like, they're not drinking enough whiskey. Yeah, you're not drinking yeah. enough. You need to smoke more. Yeah. You need to smoke more. My doctor told me I got to smoke more. Yeah, eat this belt, <laughs> smoke a pack of cigarettes. And... Eat this belt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Jelinek approached Maybach in late 1899 to build a 28-horsepower Phoenix to enter the upcoming Nice race week, Maybach was conflicted. He had concerns that the Phoenix chassis might not be a suitable application for a 28 horsepower engine, but not wanting to disturb nope. the ailing Daimler, he decided to press forward with the design along with Gottlieb's eldest son, Paul. Paul. Gottlieb Daimler succumbed to heart disease only a few months later on March 6, 1900. Maybach, his friend of more than four decades, finished the work on the 28 horsepower Phoenix in a grief-stricken state. Mm. I hope if I die, you guys will be grief stricken. Probably. I <laughs> Probably. hope you retire more than four months before you die. Me too. When Jelinek took a delivery of his custom ordered race car just a few weeks later, it would be almost as if a torch of influence had been passed from Daimler and Maybach to the sly and conniving oh, Jelinek. Uh -oh. Hey, Jellyneck here. <laughs> hey, uh, Jellyneck. Less than a month later. Nice. My head's always like this. It's always turned to the oh. side. I can't hold my head up. <laughs> He's got no spine. He's a Jellyneck. Just got a Jellyneck. Less than a month later, Nice Race Week was underway. Jellynick had entered his custom Phoenix and had requested driver and DMG factory foreman Wilhelm Bauer to race in the hill climb event at La Tubi. La Tubi? Bauer took the tiller, but only a short distance into the race. Maybach's fear that the chassis was unsuitable for the engine was realized. Navigating the first turn, the tall vehicle spun and collided with a boulder. Ooh. Bauer died from his injuries the next day. Damn. Yeesh. Don't want to make any jokes about a tall car. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad we learned not to make cars tall. <laughs> <laughs> Jelinek placed the blame on the already grieving Maybach and demanded he build him another, faster car <laughs> capable of handling oh high speeds, a project Paul Daimler was already interested in prior to the accident. Hey, listen, Maybach, you're too sad, okay? And that's the reason this other guy died. I want a car as tall as possible. Make it faster, <laughs> make it 
taller. <laughs> Paul was immediately on board. Maybach, perhaps dealing with grief in his own way, also agreed, and the two set to work immediately. <laughs> hey, yeah, our guy just died in a pretty horrific way. Let's build something faster. <laughs> I mean, you're just describing racing. Yeah, I know, but yeah. it's just funny. It's like how there's there's a lot of these bit, these episodes yeah. where that happened. Enzo Ferrari yeah, you're did just, it like 50 years later. But all he had to do is like pretend that he was grieving and wait for like 10 minutes to be like, okay, build it fast. Yeah, that could be the name of Enzo Ferrari's biography. That's true. This guy died, build it faster. Build it faster. Yeah. <laughs> build it faster. We should make a movie. Build it faster. Build it faster. Yeah. Build Who are you thinking? Faster. Adam Driver? Adam Enzo? Driver is Enzo Ferrari, but Adam Driver on stilts. <laughs> <laughs> Making him 15 feet tall. <laughs> DMG's board was less enthusiastic about the project and demanded that if the cars were to be built, that Jellynek must buy the first 36 of them. Wow. What? That's a weird number. Yep. He agreed under two conditions. One, he would be the exclusive DMG distributor in Austria, Hungary, France, and Belgium. And number two, most importantly to the history of the company, the cars be named after his daughter... Mercedes. Oh, oh, such a beautiful name. I do like that name. I do like it. I want to name my daughter Mercedes. I was also thinking about like Portia, but spelled P O R T I A. Portia de Rossi. Yeah. Portia is a cool name. It is. You can't do both. No. You'd be weird. No. Especially if you can't afford them. Mm. I think you're going to name your kid after a car. You got to be able to afford it. Ford. Ford. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to name my daughter Hyundai. I actually know a guy named Ford. Do you? Mm hmm. That's a cool name for a no, he's man. Cool. He's a good dude. Ford. What's his Humphrey. last name? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Ranger? I don't know. <laughs> dude, Ranger. Ranger. If I lived in the South, I would name That's my a great kid Ranger. name for a dog. Yeah. Know yeah. what I'm going to name my dog? Next dog? Ruger. Jet. That's a good one. Panther. Ruger's a good name for a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to name my dog Jesse. Oh, uh, that's kind of Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> what does your friend Jesse think about that? He thought it was funny. I told him yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good name for dog. Dogs need two Jesse. syllable names. I'm gonna name my next or pet Scooby. I'm Scooby, just... that's Dude, great name. Yeah. That's Scooby. a great name for a dog. Classic dog. Classic dog name. One of the goats. Or a brown cat. Scooby. Scooby? Scooby? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Reggie. Thanks, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> I think if my dog called me by my first name, though, I'd be like, "Wow, thanks, Jamie." <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, yeah. I'm your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> DMG agreed, and on December twenty second, nineteen hundred, Jellynick took delivery of the Mercedes thirty five horsepower. Ooh, Great name. Very that's... descriptive. Yeah, the Whoa. first vehicle to carry the name. And let me tell you guys, it's a looker. This thing's actually kind of sick. Yeah, it's sick, dude. It's yeah. like a little hot rod from the I like the twenties. The two colors, I guess. It's yeah. in black and white, but I'm assuming there's two. Colors. <laughs> it is a black and white photo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you got like two. Like, look, there's like two little like racing seats yeah. almost. You got yeah. some bolsters That's pretty, there. Pretty sweet. They look like um like wicker deck chairs. Yeah, almost. they're wicker. <laughs> they're wicker deck racing seats. Very then, short wheelbase. Very short wheelbase, and then there's like a big cool fender. But yeah. like so basically cool. the same horsepower as your golf, <laughs> like a stock golf from the '80s. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this 35 horsepower has become widely seen as a clear break between the motor driven carriages of the late 1800s and the modern automobile it's got a wheel hmm. in Daimler and Benz the complete history author Dennis Adler writes the Mercedes has been hailed in the motor press as the first modern automobile it introduced steel instead of wood for the chassis a honeycomb radiator in front of the engine a gated gear change lever, uh, driven gated rear shifter wheels, yep. and four passenger seating. That's sick. A simple formula which has prevailed with few basic changes to the concept for over 100 years. So this is like the coupe that we're looking at. There is a the two seater. Going to huh? be like a four seater eventually. That's what I would assume. They put two more wicker chairs backwards. Yeah. On, I think. No, as you sit on a lap. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, dude, yeah, it to be a great. car reviewer in 1900, mm. yeah. you just have to wait. <laughs> You'd be like, ah, oh. well, done with that one. Oh, that Mercedes is great. Oh. Uh, what's Ford up to? Maybe I jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Its speed was also near modern. The 35 horsepower 5.9 liter <laughs> four cylinder. That's big for a little That's one. Sick. Big old cylinders. Wow. Yeah. Could propel the car to 55 miles per hour, the typical speed limit on modern US highways today. That's 1.5 liters per cylinder. Yeah. That's like a whole big. engine. That's yeah. Crazy. And look how skinny those tires. I mean, that sounds slow, but like the tires are Dude, basically that thing rips. like big bicycle tires uh-huh i bet they had tubes they maybe 100 percent did yeah no and admit it I, they probably had they tubes. probably did dude I don't know admit enough. it i don't know enough admit it dude they had tubes they probably did. They probably dude admit did. it they probably did admit it they probably did admit it i don't know enough they probably had tubes i don't know enough. admit I see it a little valve stem there yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you got him dude got him nice <sighs> Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Shopify. We move a lot of merchandise here at Donut Media. All those t-shirts and hoodies and all the other awesome apparel available. How do we get it to you? Well, we use a little service called Shopify. Start selling with Shopify today. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. We use Shopify here to move our apparel. We even have a past guest t-shirt available on our website, and you can get that all thanks to Shopify. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. 10%! And Shopify is truly a global force. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash gas. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically trying to put an LS engine into a Miata, which is extremely hard. You just need to breathe, take it easy, and keep it simple. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. They streamline hiring with powerful tools and find you matched candidates. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. So I hire writers for Donut all the time. I think Indeed is one of the best tools that you can use especially with their instant match feature. It really helps you just weed through everything really quickly. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash pass gas. Offer good for a limited time. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This clear leap forward was not lost on people of the time either. Paul Mayen, founding member of the Motor Car Club de France, wrote an article praising the vehicle and declared... We, we have entailed the Mercedes era. <laughs> I love era. It. era. You really have to swallow your tongue on that. Era. Uh, wow. <laughs> no more Garcia para. <laughs> <laughs> A momentous shift had occurred, and virtually overnight, the terms motorized carriage and automobile could no longer be used interchangeably. Auto buyers, who at the turn of the century were almost exclusively wealthy, were no longer interested in purchasing the obviously dated carriage-based designs. Yeah, it's like having an Android. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are way ahead of iPhones. <laughs> but, <laughs> dork. <laughs> Benz and C had to respond. Carl Benz, who had been reluctant to the point of stubbornness to make improvements to his designs up to this point, found his hand forced by the Mercedes as his sales declined. In 1902, Benz introduced the Mercedes-like Parsifal and Spider models. Ooh, cool name. Renewing the sales competition with DMG. Why is a convertible called a spider? Because a spider a takes your head off? Spider. I don't know. I don't know that. Both Benz and DMG also leaned into the burgeoning world of motorsport to promote their even more powerful models. 
Since the earliest days of both companies, the interest in racing had primarily been a passion of each of the founder's sons, namely Paul Daimler, Paul, and Richard and Eugene Benz. The two teams often met on the track. Two notable instances include a Mercedes victory against a closely trailing Benz team in second and third place at the 1908 Grand Prix de France and the 1910 U.S. Grand Prix in Savannah, Georgia. Wow. In which the Mercedes team had mechanical issues. What does Google say about spider? Uh, back to the days of a carriage. There was a spider. Oh, because there was a carriage that was like haunched like a spider. Mm. <laughs> they were also called phaetons. So the Mercedes team was unable to get problems solved before the race, scoring a did not start and watching from the pits as Benz drove to a 1-2 victory over there in Savannah. Shout out SCAD. A lot of people were here. Came from SCAD. Oh, so many editors. Richard and Eugene also pushed for Benz to make a name for itself in chasing speed records. In 1910, American driver Barney Oldfield drove the 200 horsepower Lightning or Blitzen. Uh, Bends to a world record 131.724 miles per hour at Ormond, Daytona Beach. That must have felt insane at yeah. that time. I mean, it was oh, faster man. than planes of the time. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. The Florida Times wrote of this occasion, quote, The speed attained was the fastest ever traveled by a human being. No greater speed having been recorded except that made by a bullet. The following year, again at Daytona, Bob Berman <laughs> drove the same car to 141.732 miles per that, hour. That's got to be terrifying. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's crazy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I've going to need some stone crab after this. <laughs> <laughs> DMG was also taking their track success to the streets, in no small part thanks to Paul Daimler, who had replaced Maybach as chief engineer in April of 1907. Under Paul's leadership, DMG's newfound enthusiasm for speed culminated in the 1910 Mercedes 3790, a car powered by a 90 horsepower, 10 liter, four cylinder oh, engine. Oh my God. Two liters. With lightweight Two coach work that could hit 100 miles per hour. Whoa. 10 liter, four cylinder. They That's went from. 25 miles per hour to 141 like, In like very a quickly years. yeah <laughs> 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 oh, yeah the idol would sound like like that probably <laughs> <laughs> probably didn't rev <laughs> very high it probably yeah, had a I'm red line sure of maybe like four four at like a big thousand. hound dog slurping up water yeah <laughs> 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 the competition also moved outside of automobiles altogether after the invention of the airplane in 1903 both Everyone companies, was like, this is better. <laughs> yeah. Both companies realized the financial opportunity before them. They began designing engines for this new technology, planes, with DMG producing a revolutionary 388-pound, 7.3-liter inline six-cylinder airplane engine yeah. with an overhead cam in 1912. That's really light. What was it made out of? Ramen. Horse bones. Ramen. Paul, of course, saw yet another racing opportunity and fitted this engine into a Mercedes yes. race car. And experienced unprecedented success with a one-two-three finish at Le Mans in 1914. Yeah, he Damn. finished first, and then he spun around, lapped everybody, finished again. second, lapped everybody again, <sighs> finished third. Zoom, zoom, zoom. He kept like putting on like a fake mustache, <laughs> <laughs> top hat. I'll take all the prize money. Mm -hmm. The Daimler team had, from day one, been interested in what the internal combustion engine could mean for mobility, and had dedicated engineering efforts to boats, cars, public transit, lighter-than-air aircraft. And now, planes. A lighter than air aircraft, according to this note, is a blimp. Ah, oh, dirigible. Which dirigible. I figured out last week. Because mm -hmm. we you guys you. helped me. <laughs> we told you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys helped me figure out yeah. what a dirigible was last we week. Remember? It for you. <laughs> In 1909, they unveiled a new Mercedes <laughs> emblem, immediately recognizable to anyone today, that symbolized their technological reach. A three-pointed star representing mobility on land, water, and oh. in the air. James, we were at uh, Jay Leno's shop last week and uh -huh. we were wondering what that emblem meant. We yeah. were thinking maybe it was a propeller like the yeah, BMW it one. Yeah. But it kind of is though. Sort know? of, but land, air, and sea, man. Yeah. Land, air, and, air, and sea, That's just cool. like me. That's really It's sick. also the peace sign. Because no. they were way but they liked peace. No, there's peace sign has a middle one. Yeah, but they also liked peace though. 
No, I don't think they do. <laughs> I think, well, okay. I, I'm certainly... looking at the next paragraph. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this fierce competition between the two paid dividends. In 1910, both companies delivered over a thousand automobiles. And by 1912, sales had doubled for DMG and tripled for Benz, putting both at capacity for commercial vehicle production. However, with the start of World War I, mm. Joe, the era of competition between Benz and DMG was about to come to a close, and a new era of cooperation would soon emerge. Wait, so they don't like peace? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, not around this time. Peace sales, <laughs> but who's buying? By the time war broke out in November 1914, both DMG and Benz had undergone significant internal changes since the turn of the century. In addition to Gottlieb Daimler's death and Paul succeeding Maybach at DMG, Carl had resigned from his position within Benz in the early 1900s and spent time on a supervisory board before resigning altogether in the mid-1900s. The same year of Maybach's departure, Jelinek was also ousted after giving an interview with a German auto newspaper in which he took credit for the design of Mercedes cars saying... <laughs> The whole construction of the Mercedes car was and still is entirely built on my plans. He is a shyster. After his relationship with DMG had been terminated, Jelinek, who at this point had legally changed his last name to Jelinek Mercedes. <sighs> oh, oh, oh my God. What a weirdo, dude. Yeah. What? what a weirdo, dude. That's super weird. What? Whoa. Just drop Jelinek at that point. Yeah, what a creep. That's like the... Weird last it's name. It's not even anyone's last name. Yeah. What that a, is crazy. That is. Like, That's like when definition. I when I changed my name to Joe Annabelle because of your daughter Annabelle. I know my daughter <laughs> Annabelle. That is crazy. Dude. All wow. right. So he was appointed to honorary vice council of Austria-Hungary <laughs> in Monaco by nine other than the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, oh. the same Franz Ferdinand whose assassination was the primary catalyst for World War One. Yeah. After the war broke out, Jelinek was accused of espionage <laughs> by French authorities and fled to Switzerland, where he died in January 1918, 10 months before the war's end. This guy is just a weird little goblin guy. Yeah. Jelinek. I go to the mountains and no one can find me there. <laughs> I'd love to do that. That would be sick. Yeah. I've wanted to go to Switzerland for so long. I've been twice. I want to take a, a like a little tram up to a village where they sell cheese on an honor system. <laughs> <laughs> so you just take cheese? Is it's that, a little shed and farmers put the cheese in there and then you drop a little, a little euros in the bucket. Yeah, that's cool. Or francs or whatever they use. Like many automakers, DMG and Benz were forced mm -hmm. to retool their factory floors for war production. The Great War was quickly becoming the bloodiest in history, in large part thanks to the technologies that Benz and DMG introduced and advanced. Many internal combustion engine-powered vehicles made their debut in this first truly modern war, including troop transporters, aircraft, and tanks. Cool. Terrible. I was giving us a second to like, oh, really soak in sorry, the, sorry, I the to do that weight again. of that. My bad. DM, you ruined it. DMG and Benz were both responsible for producing vehicles and engines for these applications. Austrian DMG branch Austro Daimler even founded a new company in the midst of war called Bayerisch oh. Motoren Verka. Wow. Or BMW. Mm. That's crazy. I didn't know that was the case. To fill a production gap in aircraft engines for the war effort. Wow. So Merce uh, BMW is just one of the tines of the Mercedes logo. Yeah. The air one. Tines. And it's and its logo is a propeller. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Uh, that's good branding. Follow the money. <laughs> The defeat of Germany in 1918 and the signing of the 1919 Treaty of Versailles left the German economy in tatters, ushering in a period of uncertainty for both DMG and Benz. With inflation soaring, gasoline in short supply, a ban from participation in international motor shows until 1927, and a loss of foreign market interest in their products, the two companies 
or in survival mode. In the early 1920s, Benz was forced to sell off its stationary engine department, the same department that had financed Carl Benz's motor carriage efforts. DMG was determined to retain its properties and tried to manufacture items more useful to a domestic market strangled by inflation. Items such as bicycles, furniture, and typewriters. Hmm. But inflation continued to soar. Operating costs at Benz that stood at 500 million marks in October 1922 had risen to over 22 billion marks Jeez. within a year. DMG would go so far as to print their own money to make <laughs> financial transactions. It's not a good sign. No. no. I wish I still had my $500 trillion <laughs> um, Zimbabwe note. Oh, yeah. I gave it away. Yeah. To who? I gave it away to someone who did a service for me. I can't remember. <laughs> you exchanged currency for services rendered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Despite limited financial resources and foreign manufacturers like Ford entering the German market, both DMG and Benz found the means to continue to innovate and race. It was a haircut. My last haircut. I'm glad we got to the bottom of it. <laughs> At the 1921 Berlin Auto Show, DMG unveiled the Mercedes 1045-65, the world's first car with a supercharger equipped as standard. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Cool. They probably developed that for airplanes. Probably. It, the name sounds like a tire. It does. Though. I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. <laughs> Nolan's like, what are these guys talking about? <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm hip. A year later, driver Max Saylor drove the first supercharged Mercedes race car, the Model 28-95 Sport, to a class victory at the Targo Florio. At Benz, 1923 saw the unveiling of the OB2 four-cylinder pre-chambered diesel engine, the first series-produced diesel engine for commercial vehicles. That's big deal. That's huge. That's big deal. Commercial vehicles? Love diesel engines. Yeah. And Mercedes diesel engines, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> In September of the same year, Benz would also see success with their teardrop racing cars. Oh, yeah. I remember these boys. At the European Grand Prix in Monza, finishing fifth and sixth, the car would go on to win numerous hill climb and track races. I say I remember those not like remembering them in person because I am not a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> I remember pictures. <laughs> Not a vampire. By 1924, the companies were in many ways unrecognizable from where they had been 20 years earlier. In addition to being in dire financial straits and cornered into a domestic market, they had also lost connection with their founders and were now run by boards with increasingly fewer connections to the two companies' origins. Carl, Richard, and Eugene Benz were long gone from Benz and C. And in 1923, Paul Daimler had become so unsatisfied with the management, he left the company to work for Horch, a direct competitor. Which became Audi. Yeah. 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 Horch means to listen in old German, hmm. and Audi is the Latin. Audio. Yeah. No way. Wow. We should do an Audi episode. That'd be sick. We should. There's a lot of stuff that happened. Yes. The auto union. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The rivalry between the two may have spurred incredible innovations, but the loss of the rivalry was exactly what Benz and DMG needed to survive. They had reached a tipping point, and in order to avoid collapsing into bankruptcy, agreed to share resources to save themselves. In May 1924, they signed the Agreement of Mutual Interests, a cooperative and non-competitive arrangement that oversaw the financial activities of both brands, and legally established the partnership as Mercedes-Benz GmbH. Nice. That's like ink for Germany. The Mercedes-Benz partnership was largely made possible because the two companies by product. viewers like you. <laughs> <laughs> because the two companies' products had diverged from another to the point they were no longer direct competitors. Nice. Although both still made race cars, DMG was focused on aircraft, luxury, and sports cars, and Benz had thrown itself almost completely into commercial vehicle production. For the next two years, DMG and Benz operated relatively independently, combining revenue and filling in the market gaps. The other half of the company uh, had left open. 
During this period between 1924 and 25, Benz delivered the world's first diesel truck to a customer and introduced a number of other commercial vehicles. DMG, meanwhile, unveiled a new line of supercharged Mercedes and competed in the German long-distance flight trials, winning first, second, and third in Group A. They also put their award-winning aircraft engine into production. That's cool. In late June of 1926, the cooperation between DMG and Benz became a merger, establishing the two automakers as a single company, Daimler-Benz AG. Fittingly, barely two weeks later, Rudolf Caracciolo won the German Grand Prix in the first-ever eight-cylinder Mercedes. In August, an update of the joint logo was officially registered. The iconic three-pointed star surrounded by the Benz wreath and the names Mercedes and Benz. Okay, it's all coming together. Mm -hmm. The first joint appearance of the Mercedes-Benz brand was at the Berlin Motor Show that ran from October 29th to November 7th, 1926. In addition to the impressive display of Benz-designed commercial vehicles, they also introduced the first Mercedes-Benz that wasn't simply a rebadged car from the pre-merger companies called the Model K. This thing's sick. It's very elegant. Model K. It was named after ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a Benz hole right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good looking car. It looks like a wolf drives it. Or should um, I say a wolf? <laughs> a total wolf. <laughs> was it, was this supercharged? I don't know. Because K could have stood for compressor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Compressor. That'd be a cool metal name. Compressor? Oh, With a yeah. K. I yeah. bet that's like an industrial band for sure. Compressor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Dude. Uh, just got confirmation. Uh, James is correct. Uh, Compressor. Yep, that's a band. That's tight. Well, more, more applicable than, to the story. Yeah. <laughs> it was called compressor. the Model K after Compressor because yeah. it was a supercharged. Yeah. Car. The first few years after the merger made it seem as if the woes of Mercedes were behind them. Sales picked up, the economy had found stability, and Mercedes was experiencing a wealth of success on the track, including a 1-2-3 finish at the German GP at Nürburgring. But for all the motorsport success they had ahead of them in the 1930s, they would soon face their greatest challenges. Between 1929 and 1939, there were a number of developments that would change the company forever. Despite not being involved with their respective companies for decades, the deaths of Carl Benz and Wilhelm Maybach in 1929 symbolized the end of the early era of the automobile. That same year, the U.S. stock market came crashing down, ushering in the Great Depression. Germany's economy was in tatters again as was the state of Mercedes-Benz. The hardships were seemingly endless for Germany, and in 1933, Adolf Hitler rose to power, offering the German people a scapegoat for their woes. Soon after, Mercedes would find itself doing the bidding of the Nazi regime. Now, if you've listened to our episode on Hitler's racing program, you know much of what comes next. If you need a refresher, listen to that episode, or here's a quick summary. Hitler made one of his first public appearances after becoming Chancellor of Germany at the 23rd Berlin Motor Show, where he gave a speech making two promises, to create an affordable people's car and to launch a state-sponsored German racing program to showcase, quote, German supremacy. He approached two German auto manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union, and offered a cash incentive to whichever manufacturer could build a GP car to bring victory to Germany. Mercedes got involved immediately, and the next year introduced the aluminum-bodied W25s, commonly known as the Silver Arrows, which would go on to dominate racing throughout the 1930s. Mercedes also carried out numerous record-breaking attempts as part of this Nazi racing program, including a 268.8 mile per hour run in a modified W125 GP car on the newly developed Autobahn. This was a public road speed record no one would break until 2017 in a Bugatti Veyron. I'm not sure. That's got to be. Dude, 268 miles per hour. In 1939. Dude, that is fast. Mm -hmm. I think I had the same exact reaction when we did the podcast on that. But there were many requirements for this. All drivers for the Nazi team were required to be part of the paramilitary group National Socialist Motor Corps. 
Ooh. With the money Mercedes-Benz received from their work with Hitler's regime, they were able to beat back the Depression-era hardships faced by many companies all across the globe. They also developed the 260D, the world's first diesel passenger car, and numerous race cars like the W125, a GP car capable of speeds over 200 miles per hour. Mercedes-Benz also played a huge role in the remilitarization of Germany in the 1930s. They built the DB600 aircraft engine that powers several aircraft of the Luftwaffe, Germany's rapidly growing air force. Daimler and Benz, first separately and now together, had survived a world war, two financial crises, an encroachment from international competitors. But like most of Germany, its passivity to the rise of Nazism and its cooperation with the regime would lead the world to catastrophe. As a result, Mercedes-Benz and the rest of Germany would emerge from the upcoming war grappling with the horrendous pain they had brought upon their neighbors and themselves, searching for a path forward. Ooh. And that's where we'll pick up next week with part three of Mercedes-Benz. I mean, we've talked about it a couple of times. Uh, every car company gets sucked into war. Oh, yeah, because you build the stuff that... Yeah, you already have like war. the government's just like, all right, you got the stuff to make this stuff. Mm -hmm. You're working for us now. Stop building that stuff, make this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, uh, guys like Fer Ferdinand Porsche, I'm mean, obviously not connected to Mercedes, but guys like that, like Ferdinand Porsche was like an avowed Nazi. He, yeah. He was part of the party early on. And hung uh, out with Hitler at yeah. the, the crow's nest in like, Switzerland. Stole the design for Eagle's the Volkswagen. Nest, so beetle uh so we didn't get into it too specifically in this episode but i would assume that a fair part of the leadership at these companies would probably yeah, yeah i mean absolutely mercedes was the nazi car yeah like, hitler didn't ride around in a porsche yeah so i'm not gonna around in a Benz. i'm not gonna let them you know oh no i'm not yeah. i'm not trying to let them off the hook i'm just saying like uh every uh, like no uh, never mind <laughs> whenever there's a war the car companies make mm. Yes. Planes and stuff, but yeah, Mercedes, I think pretty, they wanted to be the, they were the best boy Nazi car mm -hmm. company. Yeah. Yeah. And next week, we're going to dive into that deep mm -hmm. and uh, continue this amazing story of Mercedes. But until we then, we got some listener mail. Yes, we do. Listener mail. Listener mail. From Blake G. Blake G <laughs> in the house. Blake G in the building. Got some listener mail from Blake G. Blake G, listen up. Hey, guys, the more I listen, the more I realize you also hate Tim Allen. <laughs> I'm actually from Kalamazoo, where he was arrested and snitched. Ooh. <laughs> Just glad to see the hatred is national. Have a wonderful day, and you make my days doing deliveries far more enjoyable. Hell yeah, Blake. Sincerely, Blake G. Hell yeah, dude. He put a smiley face at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. smiley face. <laughs> yeah, Tim Allen's a snitch. Hell yeah, dude. I think he's also a rotary engine, too, because have you heard him laugh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, so check us out next week for part three of this story. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Ooh. At, uh, follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Ah. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. <laughs> ah. Big thank you to Christina Felsky, Nick G. Musso, and our producer this week, Paul O'Mara. And congrats to Gavin Kinsel for his yeah. and his wife for the baby. That's right. Yeah, Paul's, the baby. Paul's uh, stepping in for Gavin because Gavin and his wife had that baby. Mostly his wife. Mostly his wife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching if you're on YouTube. Go buy Donut Apparel at Zoomies or Blue Tomato if you're over in Europe at select Blue Tomato stores. James is carving what I assume is some sort of rune into the table with a screwdriver. <laughs> Made of uh, Adam. Uh, and uh, yeah, DonutMedia.com. Support the show by getting that Wink Wink Nation t-shirt.